Um, this is a soccer ball, and this soccer ball has a problem. Can any of you identify the problem of the soccer ball? It has a dent in it, yeah? I could wear it as a hat, yeah? It's a helmet, yeah. Um, its intended purpose is not going to be very successful because it has no, or very little, air in it, okay? So it won't bounce. If I were to kick it, it won't go straight. It flops all over. It just can't do what it was intended to do because it's underinflated. It needs air in it, proper amount of air for it to function as it's intended to do. Now, we know as Christians, and most of us have grown up in Christian homes, that God has created us for what? What does it say? to do good works. So we all have grown up knowing that and we want to do good works just like the soccer ball would really like to be able to be used for its intended purpose. But the problem is many of us as Christians are functioning in an underinflated way. And we want to talk about how we can change that so we can function in the way God designed us to do. And that's exactly where we're going. This is a second in a series in the book of Acts. And uh, we are looking today at Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost occurs and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it radically changes God's people forever. And it should be radically changing our lives as well. So let's look at the impact of the Holy Spirit. Impact number one comes when Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stands up. The people are saying, what is going on? I'm hearing the, this message in my language and I came from clear across the ocean. I understand this. What's going on? And Peter stands up and says, this is a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Joel, from the prophet Joel. In which he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on how many people? All people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. Who is excluded in this? No one. Anyone who is seeking after God receives the Holy Spirit. Now this is a radical change that we take for granted as New Testament Christians, but it wasn't always this way. As we look at the stories in the Old Testament, we realize God's Holy Spirit worked in a different way in the Old Testament and that the Holy Spirit would come upon a king or upon a prophet or upon a chosen individual by God and God would use that person to lead people to Him. But as far as the Holy Spirit being poured out on everyone who was seeking God, that didn't exist in the the Old Testament. We see several stories of that. If you take out your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10. In this story, we see Saul, who becomes the first uh, king of Israel, being anointed by Samuel. And Samuel has poured the oil over his head and signified, you're going to be the king of Israel. And then we read in verse 9... As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gabeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon Saul in power and he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, What is this that has happened to the son of Kish? is Saul also among the prophets. Do you hear what they're saying? What they're saying is, this isn't right. Saul is not a prophet. What is he prophesying for? But Saul could not help it because the Holy Spirit had come upon him. This was not the way the Holy Spirit typically worked, and it kind of shook them up a little bit. Now let's go to another story. Let's go to the one in Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses goes to the tent of meeting and he invites the elders of Israel, the 70 elders of Israel, to join him at the tent of meeting. And they go to the tent of meeting and there God anoints him, Moses, with the Holy Spirit and after that he spreads the Holy Spirit to the elders who are gathered there with him. Now let's read this story because it's kind of humorous because it seems as though there are a couple elders who couldn't make it to church that day. 
couldn't quite get out of bed on time, or the shower was cold, or something, they didn't quite make it to church on time. Verse 26 of Numbers chapter 11, However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since he used, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them! Why was he saying that? This isn't right. Moses, you're the one that gets the spirit, not these guys. They didn't even come to the church today. They shouldn't get it. They're out in the camp. And listen to Moses' reply. Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Amen. Moses is like, how cool would it be if I weren't the only one with the Spirit of God, but if everyone had the Spirit of God? But in the Old Testament, I believe that God was not permitted or allowed to pour out His Spirit until Jesus Christ had accomplished His mission on the cross. Up until that point, the devil was the rightful owner, ruler, whatever you want to call it, of this planet. But at the cross, Jesus took possession again as rightful prince and king of planet Earth. When that happened, he returned to heaven and something happened. Turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Again, this is part of Peter's speech. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father what? Are you with me? <laughs> Jesus returned to heaven and received from the Father what? The promised Holy Spirit. He had received the Holy Spirit because He had accomplished His job. And Jesus now has poured out what you now see and hear. So now, Jesus has accomplished his mission and he pours it out the Holy Spirit. And it's not just on the pastor and it's not just on the elders, but it's on every one of us who believe in Jesus Christ. Every one of us who seek the Lord, the Holy Spirit is given to. Amen? That's a huge difference. That's a huge change. I want to talk to you why for just a moment. When Pam and I were in seminary, we went on a date. And we went to a Mexican restaurant one Saturday night near where we were going to school. And we went into the entrance and we told the hostess person our name and we sat down to wait along with a lot of other people who were waiting. And it was very busy that night and there were a lot of people there in the restaurant. And, and we were sitting there being sadly being entertained by the two or three hostesses who were working that night. They were all about college age young ladies and they were fighting. Blatantly fighting in front of all of us who were waiting. If one of the gals would take and seat someone without telling the others, when she get back the others would attack. <laughs> Why did you set them up? We were supposed to do that. But the biggest deal was the microphone. You know, they have those little podium things and, and uh, they have this microphone. And, uh, you know, they would announce, all oh, right, a uh, party of five, fry, or whatever, you know. Well, if some, one of the girls touched the microphone and used the microphone without getting permission, the other one would snatch it away and say, that's my microphone, you're not supposed to use it. And this was going on for 20 minutes as we were waiting to be seated. Some people actually got up and left because it was so blatantly rude. And this kind of disunity and this kind of animosity between each other doesn't make it like, this is kind of the place I want to hang out and eat, you know, and enjoy my evening with my wife. That's the way the church is without the Holy Spirit. It turns into a bunch of bickering. It turns into a lot of silos where you say, this is my turf and no one can have anything to do with my turf. That's what it becomes. So the Lord pours out the Holy Spirit and the way the Holy Spirit brings unity is that you don't need me to know God. You don't. 
Every one of us here has equal access to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ, and through the working of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit will guide just the pastor into all truth or just the elders into all truth. We believe that everyone here today who believes in Jesus Christ is to receive the Holy Spirit. And so there is a unity of purpose because we all have this experience, have the potential of knowing God for ourselves. This is a new thing that God has done through His Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for it. It brings this common purpose uh, of meaning and unity of meaning and, and uh, it's a good thing. The second thing that the Holy Spirit brings is the power to heal and begin breaking apart our selfishness as human beings. There's another story about speech other than Acts chapter 2. In, in Genesis chapter 11 is a story Shortly after the flood of Noah's day, people begin to populate planet Earth. They come to this plain called Shinar and they decide this would be a nice place to build a city and we'll build a tower that reaches to the heavens. And in this story, they begin building this city and you may wonder why on earth did they build this city? Why on earth did they want to do this? And scripture says this, Then they said, Come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make what? A name for ourselves. So that we can show off our ability as human beings to be able to do whatever we want to do. There is a shift that goes on here so that the focus is not on God and what God is able to accomplish. The focus is on man and what man is able to accomplish. God comes down, sees what's going on and says, man, if they can do this, they can do anything. And so he confounds the languages. And people are divided then with the languages and people who speak one language go over here and another language go over here and another language go over here. To slow things down, to spread people out. But then we come to Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, God does the opposite. He pours out His Spirit and He gives the ability to communicate. But we've got to look at what it is that they're communicating. In Acts chapter 2, verses 8 through 12, we see them being given the gift of, of tongues or languages. Now they were, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this, this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them uttering in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? In other words, how can they be speaking my language? I understand what they're saying. So what were they saying? Skip over to verse 22. It says, this is Peter. Men of Israel, listen to this. I have accomplished great things. My name is Peter and I am your leader. Look at me and follow me wherever I go. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Who were they focusing on? Jesus. What God was doing through his son, Jesus Christ. When man is focused on his accomplishments, on doing it himself, God has to come found. But when the focus turns and it's on God and what he can accomplish through his son Jesus Christ, he sends his Holy Spirit to communicate this so it can spread, so people can know the truth. Some people may say, well, that's kind of narcissistic of God, isn't it? I mean, he wants us only to talk about him. No, the truth of the matter is God is a God of love and he knows the only solution to man's dilemma is him. And he loves us so much that he's not allowed us to continue down our road of thinking, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, because we can't do it. At Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we oftentimes talk about prophecy and sometimes we talk about the mark of the beast and we talk about this thing called Sunday observance and, and Sabbath uh, observance and we talk about these things. But friends, this is only really the tip of the iceberg that we're talking about. We're not even dealing with the core issues. The core issue is that we as human beings are selfish and self-centered. The enemy knows that and he plays on that and he lures us in. If you think we're not self-centered, just listen to the presidential campaign. 
All they can talk about is, look what I've done, or look what I will do, or look how I could do it so much better. And yeah, and we can pick on them, but why on earth is it, friends, that everything that we do in our life, we have to post on Facebook? Because it's about us, right? It's about it. Look at me. Look what I did. Look what, I, look what I'm doing. Do you like it? We become obsessed with ourselves. And this works into the workplace. Now understand me. I believe it's important to work. I believe God gave us labor to, to help us be able to survive and, and, and that kind of thing. But there's a switch that takes place in our work where we start to believe that the work is all about me. I've got to keep working so I can keep making money. I've got to keep working because if I leave, the world will fall apart. I've got to keep working because if, if I don't, if I take a day off, I'll never get caught up again. And there's a subtle little shift that takes place in our minds. And so we start working. Last week in the paper, there's an article that said 65% of working Americans don't use all their vacation. And they don't use it because they feel like if they leave, they'll get replaced. If they leave, they'll have too much work. If they leave, there's two or three other people wanting to position. And we're petrified of losing our jobs. I'm going to say something here that's easy for me to say because I have a job right now. But I would suggest that the people today, if you're sitting here and you're unemployed, your chances of trusting on God fully are much higher than those of us who are employed. Because you have to trust in God. you got no other options. But we get our jobs and we get secure and pretty soon we just dig in. And it's a trap, I believe. It's a trap that the enemy lures us into to say, Hey, keep your head down. Keep working. Don't look up. And this is exactly where I believe the Sabbath does come in. Because God has said, Hey, here's a day that will reorient you to me instead of reorient you to you. Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts us and tells us, you know what? You are working and working and working. Are you getting where you want to be? Are you any closer to where you really want to be? And he convicts us that what we need is not more work, more accomplishment, more achievement, more money, more possessions, but what we need is Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit convicts us of. And only the Holy Spirit can heal us of our selfishness because it is so much a part of us, we don't even see it otherwise. The third impact of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is obedience. Follow me on this one. I know it's warm in here. I know you're getting hungry. You're thinking, I hope he finishes soon and I'd like to go eat. Um, personally, I'm hungry too, you know, so I'm, I'm there with you. But this is kind of an interesting point that I discovered this week that I want to share with you. And it's kind of unique, so see if it makes sense to you or not. Pentecost occurred 50 days after Passover. Jesus died on Passover and Pentecost was 50 days later. Penta stands is 50 in Greek, so, you know, that makes sense. The Jews called that Feast of Weeks. In other words, they would count off the weeks. It's too hot in here. Can you open that vent up there, Stephen? Thanks. It's not up here, brother. Why don't you come up here? That's what my wife always says. You know, it might be hot up there. It's not where I'm sitting. Okay, so Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Uh, the Jews call it Feast of Weeks because they would count off the weeks and then it would occur, or d the Day of First Fruits because it occurred at the time of the barley or wheat harvest, and the Jews would bring their thank offerings to the Lord and offer them at that time. When did the first Passover occur? Egypt, exactly. As they were preparing to... Uh, embark on their journey to the promised land. The first Passover was called for in Egypt as they were preparing to leave and enter into the freedom God gave them. It was a symbol of their salvation. Okay? 
Now, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, it states that at that time, and according to scholars, that time was about 44 days later, they set up camp in the Sinai wilderness. What happened in Sinai? The law was given. Okay? So, about 50 days after the Passover, when they left Egypt, they were given the law. And that was a Pentecost. So Pentecost was understood by the Jews to be a celebration of the anniversary of the receiving of the law of God. Isn't it interesting that God desired to pour out the Holy Spirit on the anniversary of the giving of the law? What are the implications of that? I've thought of a couple. Number one, we have to recognize through this process that God saves first and empowers second. Sometimes theologically we call this justification and sanctification. But God reached down into Egypt. He took those people who were slaves who had really no value to him in, in the sense of accomplishment or righteousness. And he said, I'm freeing you from captivity. I'm saving you by my mighty hand. Salvation is a gift. It is freely given to us. God then called them to the foot of Sinai and there he entered into what can be symbolized as a marriage relationship with them and said, now you're my people, I saved you. Here's how I want you to live. And too many people have the concept that in the Old Testament it was all about the law and legalism and performance and in the New Testament it was all about grace and whatever you want to do is good to go. But I want you to know, in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, salvation came the same way through Jesus Christ, and sanctification came the same way. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Sometimes it's hard to read this and believe it's Old Testament, but there's some good stuff in the Old Testament. One amen. You hear that? Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. It's good to hear you turn in your Bibles. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so you have to ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, listen to this. This is Old Testament. No, the word is very near you. It is in your what? It is in your mouth and it is in your what? It is in your heart so that you may obey it. God's desire always is that the law would be part of who his people are internally. Old Testament and New Testament. Now here's the thing that we see. The Holy Spirit is poured out. Oh, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me ask you this question. Did Jesus perfectly obey the law? Okay, I believe that too. I believe he did. I mean, we have uh, Romans 8, 4 that says, you know, that if we are in Christ, the law is fulfilled in us. Well, the only way that could happen is if Christ fulfilled it first, kept it first, okay? Hebrews 4.15 is where it says, uh, Jesus Christ is our high priest who is tempted in all ways like we are, yet was without sin. Matthew 5.17, Jesus says... I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. So over and over we see the law is lived out perfectly by Jesus Christ, upheld perfectly by Jesus Christ. So here's the key question. How did Jesus perfectly obey the law? By depending on his Father who empowered him with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we come to Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is poured out on who? We read it. Everyone. Okay? Not just on Jesus. Not just on the disciples or the apostles or the 120. It is poured out on all who come to believe in Jesus Christ. Which indicates to me that God, for the first time in human history, is not just giving us the checklist to look at and say, here's the things you must do. But he is saying, here's the Holy Spirit who is writing my law on your hearts and empowering you to obey it. We don't like obedience. We don't like the law, honestly. Honestly, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we don't even like the law. 
And yet the law is the very character of God. And the law is beautiful. You're thinking, okay, Carrie, you haven't been this legalistic in a long time. Okay? So what's going on here? Let's be clear, okay? It is not legalism if we realize that my obedience doesn't save me, but Christ does. Okay? It's not legalism if we realize that obedience is a fruit of walking with Jesus. It's not legalism if I realize that obedience is freeing, not controlling. Now, think about this for a moment. Jesus is the only one that we know of who perfectly obeyed the law of God. Was he happy? Yeah. Was he real? Yeah. Authentic? Yeah. In fact, of all the people that we could probably think of who've ever walked on the planet, he was probably the most at peace with himself of anyone, and he's the only one who kept the law. It might be a good thing to do. Now let's think about the religious leaders. The religious leaders were trying to keep the law of their own strength, of their own power, legalistically. Were they happy? Doesn't seem like it. Were they authentic? No. Were they honest? Were they kind? Were they generous? Were they merciful? No. So if you're still not sure about the law, I want you to answer some questions for yourself. Do you want God first in your life? Do I want a day to reorient me to God's ways? Do I want to love my parents? Do I want freedom from anger toward others? Do I want sexual purity? Do I want to be content with what I have? And do I want to be honest? If you said yes to those, you just said yes to the law of God. So we see the Holy Spirit being poured out and it brings unity to God's people because they all now can communicate with God directly. It's an incredible thing. And we see that he brings um, this ability to obey that has never, ever happened before. Here's the ironic thing to me. At the time in which God finally accomplished through Jesus Christ the ability for human beings through the power of God to obey, what does the Christian church say? The law is done away with. We can finally do it through the power of God. And we say, oh, it's done away with. Mm, I wonder what God thinks sometimes. All right. So, we're back to my underinflated soccer ball that is pretty much useless, just as we are pretty much useless. We might want unity, but if we don't have the Spirit, it's not going to happen. We might want to be obedient, but if we don't have the Spirit, it's not going to happen. So what do we need in us? We need the wind. We need the air, right? So fortunately, I brought a wind producer today, and it's not just me. Okay. So with just a little bit of air, this ball takes on a whole different dimension and possibilities. Paul said at the beginning we read, we are God's workmanship and we are created to do good works in Christ Jesus. I believe that's true. But it's not going to happen if we're underinflated. And most of us are. So God has given to us through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit en enables us to do what we couldn't do otherwise. So we can flog along, play church, and act like we're doing what God intended us to do. Or we can ask for the Holy Spirit, be inflated with the Spirit, and accomplish in a glorious way what God has called us to do. I vote for the second. All right. Let's sing a song of praise to the one who has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit.